you have a Bible, please open to Acts chapter 16 today. Acts 16. We have just begun a new series entitled Real Joy in Tough Times. This is one of my favorite chapters in all the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. In Philippi, Paul preached the gospel in Europe for the very first time there in Greece. Now, it took some time, but the dominoes of history from this missionary trip spread Christianity all over the world until it came to the USA. So what happened here? Well, two weeks ago, we saw two women receive Christ as their Savior. One was rich, one was poor. One was free, one was enslaved. One worshiped God, and one was a demon-possessed young lady. But both became saved. Who were they? Well, a wealthy businesswoman named Lydia, Acts chapter 16, verse 14, and then a demon-possessed slave girl, verses 16 to 19. Now, you know what happens when God is at work, what happens? What happens is Satan does a counterwork, a counterattack. And so this demon-possessed girl is following Paul and his team around, and, and she, she announces, these are men of the Most High God who point the way of salvation. Now, she may have done it in some type of a, a, a guttural, demonic voice. You say, why would that happen? Why would Satan tell the truth about God's missionary team? Well, she did it, the demon did it, for a couple of reasons. One is, is for confusion, and the other is for infiltration. You see, Satan will agree with the truth so long as to be able to get into a church, get into a Christian college, get into a Christian organization, and then once he is accepted, he will do the work of deception. He'll do the work of disruption. The Apostle Paul would have none of it. And so the Apostle Paul, he cast the demon out of the girl in verse 18. She was a fortune teller. She made a lot of money for her masters. And once she got saved, uh, all that, that money train dried up. And so, furious over their loss of income, they dragged the apostle Paul and Silas to the city rulers, and they were beaten, and they were put in prison. And so here we find our missionary team in prison. Today, we're going to see that there is real joy in salvation. Would you please stand with me? as I read from Acts chapter 16, and we're going to pick up the story here in verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, that's Paul and Silas, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came, trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into, the, into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house." This is a great story. Let's pray together. Our Father, we, we thank you for this historical, biblical event that happened. We thank you for what it means to us today and how it can help each one of us to have your joy in tough times because of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray right now 
that if there be one in this worship center that doesn't know the Lord Jesus as Savior, that in these next few moments together, that the Spirit of God would bring a work of great conviction and drawing and bring people to yourself. And may each Christian, may each Christian rejoice in this wonderful salvation and have a greater desire to share it with others. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, this journey we call life is a roller coaster of emotions. I mean, we're up and then we're down. Life is filled with, with joy and sorrow. Life is filled uh, with pleasure and pain and victory and defeat and love and hate, thrills and boredom and hope and despair. But there's something within the heart of every person that cannot be explained by science or human logic, and it cannot be satisfied by all the best of human experiences. God made us with a soul that will live forever somewhere. And mankind longs for eternal life, for something more than what is found in this life. And here we find a man, a man in his most desperate moment in his life, and he asked the most important question in life in verse 30. What must I do to be saved? Have you ever asked that question to yourself? Have you ever really asked that question? You see, your eternal destiny of where your soul will spend eternity is determined by what you do with that answer. It is amazing that we all have this inbuilt need to find the true God. And you, you see, without Christ, we all have an empty heart. And before you became a Christian, your, your heart is empty. It's empty of God. And millions and millions and billions of people are trying to find God through hundreds of different religions. And then, and then most of us go through these seasons where we try and drown out our guilty conscience. We know we have sinned against a holy God, but we try to find peace. We try to find happiness. We try to find distraction in the fading things of this world. And if you would look with me on page two of your notes, the world says, these things will make you happy. These things will give you some pleasure. And what, what, what is that? Well, uh, music and movies and, and popularity with your friends and relationships and success and and money, and, well, good looks, and sports, and partying, and, and now technology, which it seems that most everyone is addicted to some level or another, uh, all of your social media apps, but only God can truly fill the emptiness of your soul. A fourth century church father wrote, now listen, you've made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts will remain restless until they rest in thee. That's true. Lanny Wolf, just in the last century, wrote a song. It begins, it begins, the world will try to satisfy that longing in your soul. And there it is. There's, there's partial list of it. You may search the wide world over, but you'll be just as before. You'll never find true satisfaction until you found the Lord. For only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Yes, only Jesus can satisfy your soul, and only He can change your heart and make you whole. He'll give you peace you never knew, sweet love and joy and heaven too, for only Jesus can satisfy your soul. He will fill your heart. He will fill your heart with love. And the day you discover that He loved you first is the day that you will love Him in return. Happened to Lydia. Uh, Lydia discovered that love in verse 14, right, right in the middle of the verse. Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened. You know, God uses many different ways to bring his message to our hearts. In verse 13, Paul, uh, Paul says, it says that he, he sat down with them. Now, what, what you have is a, a little river just outside of the ancient city of Philippi. I had the opportunity to visit many years ago. And, and so, since there were no there was no synagogue in the town. The Jewish women 
and their children, they would go outside and they would sing and read the scripture. And so Paul comes and the Bible says he sat down. And so Paul uh, joins with these ladies and he begins talking with them. And, and they were either Jews or they were Jewish proselytes. That is, they converted to Judaism. And he's sitting down, he's talking to them, just engaging in conversation. What are you doing? Well, we're, we're, reading, we're reading the scriptures here. And we, you know, it talks about Messiah. And he says, well, I want you to know Messiah has come. He did. What's his name? His name is Jesus. And so Paul explains that. And the Bible says, God, God opened her heart. God opened her heart. She became a Christian. Not only did she become a Christian, but I mean, she opened her house. And she invited folks to be able to come in the first church in Philippi, actually met in her house, and she helped uh, finance the, uh, the church. Wonderful thing. But God uses different approaches to bring different people to himself. In the prison guard, God is going to take a different approach. He's going to use some suffering, singing saints, and an earthquake to be able to bring the prison guard to Christ. How did God open your heart? How did he open your heart? Was it a still small voice? Did you read a track? Was it coming to a preaching service? Was it a train wreck of sin? Did God get your attention through the witness of a friend? A moment of sin? To reach the prison guard, God is going to allow Paul to go to prison. Now, there's a couple of ways to get into prison, isn't that right? What's the most obvious way to get into prison? You break the law. You break the law, you get caught, judge sentenced you to, to jail, you go to jail. That, that's one way. Here's another way is to be falsely accused. Paul and Silas are falsely accused and they go to prison. Let me give you a third way to go to prison. While burglarizing a house in Antwerp, Belgium, a thief... A thief fled out the back door, climbed over a nine-foot wall, and dropped down into the city prison. <laughs> Don't you hate it when that happens? <laughs> Where he was promptly arrested. Now, how did Paul and Silas, how did they get into this prison? They were simply obeying the Great Commission. They were sharing Christ. And before they knew it, they were dragged before the city rulers, and they were ordered to be beaten. The local police were called lictors, and they carried around a pile of rods wrapped together, and they stripped Paul and Silas down to the waist, and they beat them with the rods on their back. How many? How many? The Bible says many. That's a lot. Verse 23. Then they threw them into prison. Look at it in verse 24. Who, having received such a charge thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now, when we think of stocks, we think of colonial America, like you see here in Williamsburg. Now, here's a couple of scoundrels. I'm not sure what they did uh, to get into this situation. But, you know, Scotty and I were in there for about 30 seconds to get the picture. It was uncomfortable. I want you to imagine being in something like this for hours, days, weeks. But apparently some of the stocks found by archaeology isn't like this. Some of the stocks would be a series of holes. And so what they would do is they would actually stretch the legs of the prisoners. Oh, oh, oh let's try Let's make it a little bit wider, a little bit wider so that those leg muscles would cramp severely. So here they are. Their backs have been beaten to a pulp. Maybe they have some crushed vertebrae. Maybe they have some cracked ribs. They're locked in a dirty, stinking, filthy dungeon. They are aching and bleeding, confined to an area with rats and disease and where prisoners were forced to exist in their own filth, if you can imagine. Why? 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 Because they shared Christ. I'm sure some dear soul would have said, why do you guys keep getting into such trouble? Why do you keep getting into all these messes? You go into a town and you get in prison. You go to another town to get beaten. You go into another town and you're back in prison again. Oh, Paul, why, why are you so bold? And then you get into trouble and then you keep saying, pray for me, pray for me. Well, you know, if you wouldn't get into so much trouble, I wouldn't have to spend so much time praying for you. Why do you do this? Well, sometimes the Spirit leads us into trouble, right? Look at verse 25. At a midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. 
They couldn't sleep. They're in such pain. They prayed. They sang. They sang so loud the other prisoners could hear them. They wanted the other prisoners to hear them because they wanted to be a witness for Christ. What do you think they were singing? Maybe they sang the Halal, Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. Maybe they sang some other psalms. Maybe they sang, maybe there was a hymn written by someone back in their home church. They were singing, they were singing loudly. If you want to have real joy, this is crucial for you to understand. Would you look with me at the bottom of page two in your notes? You may wonder, why are they singing praises to God? What in the world do they have to praise God for? Answer, if God is worth praising right now, and he is, and you just did it. You, we just sang praises to Jesus Christ. If God is worth praising right now, then he is worth praising all the time. Amen? Are you with me here? We say, oh, oh, if you only knew my troubles, if you only knew my problems. Now listen to this. Praising God has nothing to do with your problems. Praising God has nothing to do with your trials. Look at the top of page 3. Paul said in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say what? Rejoice. Say it again. What? Rejoice. rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say what? Rejoice. rejoice. So we're not rejoicing in our circumstances. We're not rejoicing because we have problems or don't have problems. We're rejoicing in the Lord. We're giving praise to God because he is worthy of that. You, you can't have joy in all of your circumstances. They're not always good. Paul even said, I have continual sorrow in my heart for the Jews who are not even saved. Romans chapter 9 verse 2. I can hear their prayers. What do you think they prayed? God, I don't know why I'm here. My legs are cramping and my back is aching. My back is killing me, but I know you're on the throne of heaven. God, I love you. God, I want to praise you. I want to praise you for what you're doing. If you want to be a defeated Christian, Christian, you start focusing on your problems. You understand that? Just get your eyes off God, and you begin to focus on your problems, upon your trials, upon the drama of your life. I mean, right now. Does it bother you when Christians say things like, oh, I have this big problem. Where is God? Why is this happening to me? Why is God letting this happen to me? You're focusing on the problem. Let me give you an illustration. You ever see a toddler who discovers an ant on the sidewalk? Mesmerized. Look at that thing. And when you focus on your problems, you're just like that toddler looking at that ant. And what you need to do is you need to, you need to lift up your eyes and you need to look up to heaven. You need to look up to the God who made you and saved you and loved you and understand who he is. If you're going to, to be like Paul and Silas and you're going to sing in spite of unbearable pain, if you're going to live above your circumstances, you got to have a glimpse of God. you got to see who God really is. You know, we all can quote Romans 8, 28. The problem is believing it when we are in the trial. These Christians never let their problems change their view about God. Their trials never changed their view about their theology, what they believed about God and who he is and his love and his care and his mercy and his salvation and his forgiveness. You say, I wish I, I had that kind of song in my heart during my trials. You can. You can have it. How? Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. And so if you are unhappy, right now if you are unhappy, it's because you're not filled with the Spirit. If you are miserable, if you are miserable right now, it's not because of your problems. You're miserable because you're not yielding your life to God's plan. When you are spirit-controlled, Ephesians 5, 19, 20, 21 tells us that he is going to give us a song in our heart. He is going to give us thanksgiving on our lips. He is going to give us a humble spirit to others. You're going to have problems, but God is going to walk through those problems with you. 
And he's going to give you victory in your heart. Now, you talk about problems. Look what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. I have it in your notes. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8. Watch. We are troubled on every side. That's my problem. That's my circumstance. Yet not dis distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted. That's my circumstance, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Paul admits to problems, but doesn't lose hope. So God, God does what he needs to do when he wants to do it. With Lydia, he opened her heart like a flower. With this guy, it's going to take an earthquake. Look at, at, at Jude. Look what Jude wrote. And some having compassion, making a difference. And deathers save with fear. What does it say? Pulling them out of the fire. You understand when you die, there are only two places. There's heaven and there's hell. There's no purgatory. There's no limbo. There's nothing in between heaven and hell. And the Bible says that some people, they respond to compassion. They respond with a gentle nudge. Others of us need a more bold and urgent persuasion. And the picture Jude has is of someone blindly walking into a building that's on fire or walking off the edge of a, a volcano into the lava. What would you say to them? Hey, hey, be careful. You would shout, you're in danger. Look at verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. You say, did this happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now this is a very specific earthquake localized right at the jail. It's pretty amazing. Not only did it open up all the doors, uh, but it also opened up all their chains. Uh, I mean, the stocks just fell apart. Amazing. You, you, you want to know what Paul was singing? Now get the picture. Uh, this is actually a, a portion of the jail found from first century ancient Philippi where the apostle Paul was. And so what you have is the, the apostles are singing. Paul and Silas are singing. And then God shakes it. You want to know what song they were singing? It's kind of obvious, isn't it? Jailhouse rock. Right? <laughs> Jailhouse rock. This is way before Elvis Presley. I want you to know Mrs. Joyce Cooper... She, one of her deacon's wives, she was a Presley fan before she became a Christian. And uh, she, uh, when I told her about this, she volunteered to lead us in the first verse. I declined that offer. I just want you to know we, we declined that offer. And so here they're singing away. God shakes this thing up. Do you know what this says to us? It says that God is with you when you speak for him. It says that God is with you when you speak for him. And if he needs to, he'll even move the earth. So when you speak for Jesus Christ, you have his message, you have his power, uh, you have the, the obedience of his great commission to do what he wants you to do. God is with you when you share a word of witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is preparing hearts for salvation, and it's going to bring joy. It's going to bring great joy. Look at verse 27. So you have the earthquake. The jailer is asleep, verse 27, and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open. Who is he? He is probably a crusty, hard, retired Roman soldier who's been put out to pasture. He's in charge of running this stinking jail in Philippi, but this is his occupation. This is his identity. The only thing he had to live for was this little bit of prestige, a little bit of honor as a jailer to tell people what to do. And he, he wakes out of his sleep. He's probably in a, in a foyer open area at the, at the entrance of the jail. And, and because of the shaking and the noise, things falling off the walls, walls cracking, he, he wakes up and the first thing he sees are the doors are open. The doors are open. Look at verse 27. And he drew out his sword and he would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Wouldn't you think that? He assumes the prisoners have escaped. And so he figured they're all gone and just that quick, just that quick, he thinks, I've lost the only reason to live. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my honor. They're going to blame me for the escaped prisoners. I would be too embarrassed to be locked up myself. 
this moment of hopelessness happens in every culture and in every generation. Men and women, young and old, rich and poor, and they lose hope. And all they see are their dire circumstances. They lose hope for living. This guard is right on the edge. He's right on the edge. And he says to himself, my life is over. My life is over. Life is not worth living anymore. I'm going to end it. You know, despairing of life is all too common today. Many, many families in our church have friends or relatives or co-workers who have taken their lives. Why? Well, there are many causes for suicide today. There's, there's psychiatric illness. There's loss of hope. There's long-term difficulties in relationships, friendships, and family there's substance abuse, usually alcohol. And now we have to add the many accidental suicides through overdose, drug overdose. We've all heard the stories of the boyfriend, girlfriend break up and then one takes their life. And now murder-suicide is all too common. Every day, every day in America, there are three murder-suicides. Maybe, maybe someone plants the seed. There's a fight, an argument, and they, they blurt out, to a family member or a friend, I wish you were dead. And that one sentence, like a seed, gets planted in their mind and they can't get it out. It begins to grow. We've all heard of the black box warning. It's listed on certain kinds of medication. Suicidality in children and adolescents, teenagers. Antidepressants increased the risk of suicidal thinking and behavior among those with major depressive disorders. This is a big thing with teenagers. It's a big thing with senior saints and everyone in between. The Philippian jailer begins to act on his dark thoughts. Here you see the dagger. Verse 27, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself. Catch the drama of the scene. Look with me at verse 28. And Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Paul understands exactly what he is going to do, and he understands why he is going to take a knife just like this and thrust it into his heart. Now remember, this is the guy without compassion. This is the guy who, who earlier in the day took him and thrust him into the inner prison. This is the guy who said, oh, let me spread your legs here in the stocks. Oh, that's not enough. Let me make them wider and wider. A guy without compassion. And now the Apostle Paul is standing between him and death. If Paul would have just hesitated, done nothing, I mean silence, Nothing stands between Paul and freedom except this man, and he's ready to take care of that for him. Now think about it. We like, to, we like to rationalize our wrong behavior, don't we? We like to rationalize our lack of good behavior. We can blame parents, friends, God. After all, didn't God create the earthquake? Didn't God break off the shackles? Didn't God open the doors so I could walk out free? You talk about an open door. The only thing keeping me here in this prison is this man, and he's about ready to take care of that. And this is really hard for Americans to understand because we, we tout the virtue of freedom as like the most important thing, but it's not. More important than freedom is sharing the gospel. And so the apostle Paul, he speaks up, He's going to lose his freedom when he could walk out free. And he speaks up and he says, hey, Mr. Jailer, we're all here. Stop. Don't do it. Nobody has escaped. Imagine the reaction of the jailer. Imagine. Verse 29. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Trembling, shaking, literally. Now who's on top of the world? Look how God reversed the situation. Look who's on his knees now. It's the jailer standing, Paul and Silas. Salvation is God's work. God has been convicting this man of his sin. 
That's the work of the Holy Spirit. God has done all the preparation. And between the singing of the suffering saints and the noise and movement of the earthquake, his conscience is awakened. God turned a spotlight on his sinful soul. He knew he was lost. He knew he was a sinner. He knew his life was meaningless. And look what he asked. Verse 30, the most important question that has ever been asked in the history of the human race. What must I do to be saved? Notice what he didn't ask. Hey, why didn't you guys leave? The doors are open. Did you feel that earthquake? Man, that was some big earthquake. I mean, must have been a 9.2 on the Richter scale. No, no. He could care less about the earthquake. All he could think about was, I am not right with God. I am a sinner that needs forgiveness. I need mercy. Can you help me? What must I do to be saved? I like a simple question. I like a simple answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You put me first. He was desperate. I just want to be saved. Friend, I'm telling you today, that's the question. There's the answer. So here are the evidences that you are really saved. Number one is trust Christ alone for salvation. He is not trusting in works. He's not trusting in baptism. He is not trusting in sacraments. He's not trusting in a church. Trust Jesus Christ alone, that he is who he said he is. He is the son of God. He died for you and he rose again. Secondly, number two is turn away from sin. Turn away from sin. When you turn to Christ, you're turning away from something. You're turning away from sin. What are you asking Christ to save you from? From sin, from the penalty, from death, from hell, from the lake of fire. You're asking God to save you. If you don't need a Savior, then you're blind. Because every one of us needs a Savior. So we turn away from sin. Now, no, we don't become perfect, but we begin to have works of righteousness in our life. What are the evidences that you are really saved? Well, uh, one is that you, you turn to Christ. Two is you turn away from sin. Number three is you share Christ with family and friends. This man got saved and on the spot, the first thing he wants to do is tell his wife. He wants to tell his kids, his family. He was so convincing because they all got saved. Look at verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. Verse 34, and when he had brought them into his house. An evidence that you are really saved is you talk about Jesus and you talk about him to the people you love. And if you don't talk about Jesus to the people you love, you need to ask yourself, am I really a Christian? Here's one, number four, believer's baptism by immersion after salvation. Look with me at verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his house. Right now, now, now look at me. Right now, if you have not been baptized by immersion after your salvation, and you have no plan to get baptized, you should question the genuineness of your salvation. Why? Why? Because every person, I mean every person in the New Testament who became a Christian was baptized. Every person. Well, there's one exception. Do you know who it is? What's the one exception? Man on the cross, thief on the cross. So if you're getting crucified, you have a good excuse not to get baptized. If your life was in danger by going underwater, you have a good excuse not to get baptized. You know, in 34 years of being a pastor, that instance has only happened one time. One time. Rob was in our first service, Rob Gorman. He, he's, he's basically almost paralyzed. But when Rob came to us, he said, ah, Pastor, I want to get baptized. Now it took three of us, but Rob got baptized. 
Now, you're healthy, and you're here today, so you have no excuse. So you, if you have been saved, the evidence of your salvation is believer's baptism by immersion after salvation. And you say, Pastor, Pastor, are you trying to make me doubt my salvation? No, no, no. I'm trying to make you doubt a false profession. I'm trying to make you doubt a false sense of security. <sighs> tragedy. The tragedy of your life. Teenagers, the tragedy of your life would be to come to a Bible-believing church and die without Christ. It'd be a tragedy. You say, ah, oh, but I, my, my parents told me I prayed when I was four. That's not salvation. Salvation is... The Spirit of God is inside of you, and you choose to become a lifelong follower of Jesus Christ. Disciple means likeness. You're becoming more like Jesus every day, every week, every year. Here's one, another evidence, sacrificial kindness to others. Sacrificial kindness to others. Look at verse 33. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes... And when he brought them into his house, he set meat before them. This is great. I mean, you talk about a cornerstone prison ministry. The prisoners here lead the guard to Christ. Brother Wilson just told me he was a greater for this morning. And eight prisoners got saved this morning. But in this story, it was the prisoners leading the guard to Christ. And then he takes them to his house. Maybe it was next door. Maybe it was down the street. And, he, and they wash the wounds of the back, and they give him food to eat. What are the evidences that you are really saved? Now, here we come to number six, and this is the point of the message. Unending joy in your heart. Verse 34, look at it. Underline it, circle it. And they rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Here is a man in despair. Here is a man who is ready to take his life. Here is a man who is desperate. Here is a man who is without hope. Here is a man who is without happiness. Here is a man who is without purpose. And when God moves in, he has real joy. Real joy in tough times. And you can have it too. You can turn your eyes upon Jesus. And Christian, you're going to meet him in heaven. You're going to meet his wife. You're going to meet his kids. Now, none of us, none of us right now are in the state that this man was in, desperate, ready to take his life. None of us were in the situation that Paul and Silas were in, beaten, hurting, in prison. And both of those people had extreme joy, real joy. Why can't you have it? You're like the toddler looking at the ant. Lift up your eyes. Look at your God. This is cool stuff. You can have real joy in salvation. May we pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for these, these men who, in the midst of their hurt, cared about others. Help us to care. Thank you for this Philippian jailer and his family who received Jesus as their Savior and discovered real joy. Father, I pray, for, I pray for my church family. Lord, so many, they're so focused on their problems, on their trials, on their drama, on their health issues, broken friendships, broken family relationships, and they've lost their joy. God, help them to put their eyes upon you love you and serve you and rejoice in you. With their heads bowed or eyes closed, if you'd say, Pastor, if I, if I died today, I know I'd go to heaven because there was a day that I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that I'm a Christian. I know that I'm a true and genuine follower of Jesus Christ, not because I've been baptized and not because I go to church and not because I'm sincere or do sacraments, but because I believe from my heart that Jesus died for me and rose again. I've got a Bible reason that I know when I die, my soul will go right to heaven. If you have that kind of confidence, 
If you have that assurance, would you simply raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? You may put your hands down. You'd say, Pastor, if I died, I think I'd go to heaven. I hope I'd go to heaven, but I'm not sure. Do you know God brought you here today by divine appointment to hear his wonderful message of love, his invitation for you to become part of his forever family. And the way you do that is not by getting baptized and not by joining the church or turning over a new leaf, but by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. That means trusting. That means acknowledging that you need to be forgiven of your sins and that Jesus will forgive you if you will ask, believing that he is the Son of God who died in your place and took your hell and offers heaven eternal life for you. If you'd like to do that, you can do what I did many years ago, right where you're seated. It's an invitation prayer. And you can pray and call out to God. And God will forgive your sin. And God will do what he did for the Philippian jailer. He'll do it for you right now. If you're not sure that heaven's your home and you'd like to receive Christ, I'll, I'll pray with you. My prayer won't save you, but you could pray and be born into God's family. Would you simply raise your hand? I, I want to do that. I've got to do that. The Spirit of God is, is tapping on my heart, and I want to do it right now. Anyone at all, I'm not sure that heaven's my home, but I want to trust Jesus right now. I want to trust Jesus right now. Christian, may I ask you, have you been baptized after your salvation? Baptized by immersion after your salvation. If not, if not, and the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart and you say, I want to be obedient to the command of Jesus. And I, I, I promise the Lord in my heart that before the end of this year, I will be baptized. Would you simply raise your hand? I want to pray for you, anyone at all. I've never been baptized after I was saved. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? I want to be baptized. God bless you. Anyone in the balcony? I've never been baptized. I want to get baptized before the end of this year. God bless you. Father, thank you. Thank you for your great love. Your love to save us from our sin. Your love to take us to heaven, to be with you. Now, Lord, I pray you'd fill us with the joy of the Lord. And may we share that wonderful joy with others. We do love you. And we praise you for this great salvation. Now, may you bless in this invitation time. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song of invitation. It's called, My Jesus, I Love Thee. I know thou art mine. We'll give you an opportunity. Maybe you want to speak to a pastor or a pastor's wife. Maybe you want to pray at the altar or pray in your seat. Say yes to God as we sing together in the first verse. My Jesus.